twin motor, twin flywheel. The model really does ooze perfection from every single pore. Hi there, it's so great to see you. You're looking good and welcome back to the channel. I'm Jenny Kirk, welcome you up here to the loft on Weir Yard. And today we're going big or we're going home. Well, we're not going home, we are home, but we are going big. And uh, if that little tongue twister has got you a little bit intrigued, well, we're going O-Gage. And we've reviewed O-Gage quite a lot here on the channel. Now, I do have a garden railway in that scale, and I've got a little uh, small shunting layout too. And it really has never been a better time to go up in size to the senior scale. There's some great models out there. And whilst I was at Worley, I had a good peruse of some of the ones that Hellion had on their stand. And one that really did catch my eye was the all new release of the Class 26. Now this is actually quite a huge model, certainly very, very heavy in O-Gage. And Hellion very, very kindly lent the channel one of these for a review. And I have to be completely honest here and say, I have been so taken by it. I've contacted Hellion and said, um, can I buy it? Because um, I really like it. So I have actually ended up buying the model in today's review. But without further ado, let's go and see just what it was about this model that made me put my money where my mouth was. Today's video comes in association with Trainomatic makers of DCT decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. Find the full range available to order now at tramfabrique.co.uk. Additional support comes from Rails of Sheffield. Sell to the name you know and trust. Buy, sell or exchange any age or any gauge. Call them now for the very best price. Check them out today at the link below. I must admit, this is the largest locomotive that we've reviewed in O-Gage on this channel. Normally we've done smaller shunting locomotives, but I have to say that this really is a monster and it's actually jam-packed with quite a few interesting features. What are they, I hear you ask? Well, you're going to have to watch to find out. So come with me and let's take a good close look at the all-new Hellion Class 26. The Hellion O-Gage Class 26 is pretty much the largest production item that I've reviewed here on the channel. And as you can see, I've wound my rostrum camera all the way up and we're still struggling to fit all of the box on camera. It's a substantial box and it has to be said that this is incredibly heavy as well. I'd wager a couple of kilograms at least. So you do get a lot of model for your money. We're looking at a price tag of around the £550 mark, a little bit of variance depending on which retailer you go to. And uh, the particular example that Hellion have loaned to the channel is uh, catalogue number 2679. And this is the BR Blue Class 26 one as a 26037 in the factory weathered version. And it should also be noted that whilst Hellion do do uh, the locomotive in all of the applicable liveries from early as delivered BR Green right through to some of the sectorization liveries, uh, there's only this and the other factory weathered version which uh, actually are finished for the user with all of the numbers applied. The others are unnumbered and do require the end user to pick their running number of choice and apply that. The locomotive itself comes with uh, working lights, interior lights. We've also got, um, as you would uh, expect, sprung buffers. It's DCC ready. And this is with the XL pin connection. And this is natively supported by ESU in their lock sound range. And uh, looking at some of the retailers I can find online, you're looking at around £192 for an ESU lock sound XL sound decoder suitable for this type of model. 
It also includes provision to natively support the ESU uh, smoke unit, which can be controlled by that XL decoder. And that is, of course, one of the interesting options that you can do in these larger scales. The box is substantial, very heavily built, and is incredibly good at protecting the model within from any kind of damage. We've also got the user manual, which uh, as well as outlining how we can add in any of the uh, separately applied details, such as head code discs, uh, radio pods, miniature snow plows, depending on your prototype and the period that you wish to actually uh, model it as. But we've also got a uh, detail of the history of the class, there were uh, 20 built in the original pilot scheme. These later became the 26-0 subclass. And then 26 production machines with some detail differences. And these became the 26-1s. Whilst they were delivered to the Great Northern section of the Eastern Region, initially based at Hornsey Depot in London, they were very quickly moved northwards uh, to Scotland, which uh, became what the class were associated with throughout their working life, including becoming uh, nicknamed Muck Rats, along with the Class 27s. And this is due to the similarity with the Class 25s, which were nicknamed as Rats because they got every everywhere and because these were the Scottish version then um, they they got the the muck rat designation they were incredibly successful and even when supplanted by class 37s on passenger workings uh, they were still finding uh, good use with freight and engineers work being upgraded with air brakes and slow speed control equipment and when they were finally withdrawn in October of 1993, no fewer than 13 were saved from scrap, with seven Class 26Os and six Class 26Ones surviving, most remaining in Scotland, but three are uh, available to see at Barrow Hill, Fangothlin and the Gloucester and Warwickshire Railway. In the booklet, we've also got the exploded diagram, which shows all of the parts that go into these models and also shows you the interior layout, including where you add in the ESU smoke unit and room for speakers and such like. Inside the box, we've got a heavy duty foam insert. I'm going to take that off. The locomotive itself is natively screwed onto a wooden plinth, which is nicely fitted. We also have the details bag, and this includes the miniature snow plows, the head code discs, and also some other detail differences which cater for different members of the class and different time periods. The model itself really easy to lift out. Just pull it by the wooden plinth it's on. The plinth also ensures that you're not going to risk damaging the model. And actually, you can even hold this upside down and it won't fall off. It's a really great way of protecting the model in transit and also providing a means whereby this can actually be uh, displayed, say, on a shelf or a mantelpiece really quite safely without worrying about um, having to uh, run the risk of damaging any part of it when you pick it up or move it around. And this uh, wooden plinth has cutouts to take the wheel treads which are appropriate for the gauge. To get the locomotive off this, we've just got two crosshead screws underneath. I've actually chosen to put the model back into the box and allowed the foam of the box just to protect it whilst we unscrew each of these. It's quite easy, they're not massively over torqued and then the plinth comes off and this can be kept for further use either with display or for storage. Now we just very, very gently lift out the model and you'll also find a couple of spacer pieces. Just remove them. And then the model itself is free of the packaging. On the workbench now, you can see that there is certainly a wealth of detail with these models. And this is the factory weathered, factory numbered version. And it's quite common 
with O-gauge models that the end users tend to prefer to actually number them themselves. They usually have a particular member of the class in mind and that gives a lot more flexibility. But for those modelers such as myself who've come up from double O, that's still a little bit of an alien experience. So it's nice to see that Hellion do also cater for us with the complete ready to run finish. And this has the addition of the weathering. Now it is a very heavy locomotive. So uh, I may not be picking it up as much as I do in my double O reviews, but you can see that the weathering is far more than just a simple blow over with an airbrush. Looking along the uh, base of the model, just along the sole bar level, you can see that everything underneath has this uh, liberal covering of this grimy brake dust type colour. And Hellion have picked the perfect colour. It's very easy to get this wrong, uh, but Hellion have managed to get the perfect rendition of this colour. And you can see that it extends just slightly up to the lower area of the body side. We've got additional grime around these side grills and this would be prototypical where the air is uh, being moved through by the cooling groups you tend to get an extra build-up of filth and then we've got a lighter dusting over the rest of the locomotive. Looking to the front of the locomotive we've also got an additional process on there with some weathering whereby it's been brushed downwards, like it's been cleaned with the passage of rain and such like. So it's not a uniform dusting, but it's actually a much more prototypical finish. We can see that too, if I turn the model round again, different at both ends. One thing that we don't have is the little clean paths where the windscreen wipers would have gone across the windows. Those would need to be done by applying a mask during the weathering process, but actually it doesn't detract at all from the model and it is something that the end user can always do themselves. And certainly this is one of the better factory applied weathering finishes that I've seen from manufacturers of late. And Hellion are definitely paying a lot of attention to how the weathering on real models actually looks. These side grills are particularly special for me. We've got this etched metal grill and behind it you can see the structure which is exactly as per the prototype of the locomotive giving a real sense of depth into there and it really is exquisitely detailed. The glazing is flush. The clear plastic that is used though is a little bit on the thick side for the scale and you do from certain angles get a little bit of a prismatic effect but not too much. There is internal lighting to this model which includes engine room lights and certainly it's a nice touch which will be quite visible on a model of this size. Concentrating below the sole bar level you can see the wealth of detail on these bogies. The model is all wheel pickup and all wheel drive, but certainly we've got the full representation of the primary and secondary suspension with these coil springs and the axle boxes in their W type irons that look like they could slide up and down, even though they don't actually do that on the model. There are a lot of separately applied parts such as there's pipework, cylinders, steps lining up nicely with the actual cab door, sanding boxes, and there's a lot of air gaps through so you can see the layer upon layer of the detail. The heavy duty slab sided construction of these bogies is very much apparent and Hellion have captured the wraparound look of the ends at both ends really, really well. The detail actually continues right back even in the areas where you can't natively see and it's this attention to detail that is really quite pleasing. Looking along the base of the model where the chassis joins with the rest of the body there is again even more detail with all of the riveting and gussets naturally picked out and again this is really important on a scale such as this where you really can see the difference. The battery boxes and fuel tanks too. 
These are separately fitted details and include everything that you would expect to see on the real locomotives, with detail that also continues into the crack in between. And that, again, more attention to detail. You wouldn't normally see any of that, but it's there. The other bogey as well, equally as well detailed. Again, we've got the uh, cab steps lining up with the door. The buffer beam detail is all factory applied, which is very important, especially on a weathered example such as this, because it then just blends in. You can also see that some of the multiple working cables do have the appropriate colouring there, which is muted by the dirt that's applied with the weathering process, but still just about visible. The coupling itself is metal, and this is the coupling that you'll be using in O-Gage, and surprisingly, they are quite practical. It's really, really well detailed, and certainly the locomotive is not taxed by pulling any train that you might throw at it. I am not going to be able to test this to its limit, not by a long way, but I've got every faith that this sprung-loaded coupling is more than enough to be able to take the weight of any train that you wish to throw at it. The buffers are fully sprung, and that's actually quite important in O-Gage, because with the nature of coupling, the wagons and coaches do actually buffer up as per the prototype. And that's where the spring is important to keep everything as it should with no risk of buffer lock or hunting as wagons crash backwards and forwards into the locomotive running the risk of derailment. The rest of the detail on these cab fronts really is exquisite, but you can see separately applied windscreen wipers, handrails, these are metal, and all of the lighting with the holes ready to take the head code discs as per what the user wishes. Cabs too are fully detailed. There is cab lighting on this model which allows us when it's running to see the interior and there's a lot of detail in there. Cab doors are exactly as per prototype and with this livery we've got this wraparound yellow which was very much a feature of the classes 26, 27 and 33. Handrails are recessed, they feel like they're metal and certainly very, very robust and picked out in this slightly grimy colour which sets them off so, so well. The printing on the TOPS number and the TOPS data panel really is sharp and even under magnification, not seeing any problems at all. There's no fuzziness. The overhead warning flashes too, crisp and sharp. Moving further back, the double arrow, no sign of blurring. And when we look closely at the yellow, we've got a very, very sharp demarcation between the yellow and the blue, which is very important, possibly more so at this scale, because you're more likely to see if anything is not as it should. The rivet detail around these grills is very pronounced, just as per the prototype. We've also got a wealth of other detail. The closer you look, the more this model gives. Body side door is moulded detail, but really nicely done. It looks like a real door. And that's exactly what you would expect, but Hellion have managed to capture that perfectly. The three hinges do protrude as per the prototype, and it's actually hard to tell that they're moulded. They are incredibly well done. Looking to the roof, you can see that we've got a really great effect with this weathering. Again, it's not just a blowover. There's a lot of thought gone into how this weathering is applied. So we've got the exhaust soot. We've got cleaner patches as well. And you can see on this roof hatch, there's some of the lighter coloured paint still showing through. The exhaust port, we have this sooty finish around it that has kind of caked the entire roof. This is actually how weathering should look. The locomotive is dirty but not so dirty as to be unbelievable. And we can still see all of that detail. All of the lifting eyes, they look like they're separately applied. It's very difficult to tell. I think they are separately applied metal details. They're certainly very, very robust. There's a lot of separately applied bits and pieces. And then we've got the roof fan there just behind its grill. 
This appears to be controlled by a separate motor, so you can spin it up completely independent upon whether the locomotive is moving or not. The horns just there in the roof pod, again, separately applied and really, really sharp and crisp moulding. All in all, a superb model which really does reward close inspection because there is a lot of depth of detail here. For those modellers who may be coming up from double O, it's actually quite breathtaking just how much extra detail there is on a model of this scale. And it's heavy, really heavy. There is so much weight for adhesion in this. It is just blowing my mind. There is nothing that, that I expect this locomotive cannot pull. It really is quite staggering just how heavy this locomotive is. Moving the model onto some of the packaging foam just to ensure that we don't scratch anything. I'm just going to roll it over and I want to draw your attention to some micro switches. We've got full control over the lighting down here and this is particularly useful for DC users and it means that you can turn on or off all manner of different functions including tail lights, cab lights, and also engine room lights so that they're not permanently illuminated. On DCC, we have a number of different functions preset, so all of these can be controlled just from the DCC handset. To gain access inside the locomotive, there are four screws that we need to undo. Looking down in between the bogey frames, you'll see two screws which hold the motor in place, and then another one just up here behind the lead axle on each end of the bogey. These are the screws that we need to carefully remove. With a crosshead screwdriver, we just loosen that off. I'm going to use a magnet just to make sure that I can draw that screw out. And you can see there, quite a long one. Don't lose these. Obviously you're going to need that when you reassemble the model. I'm just using some neodymium magnets attached to the end of my jeweler's screwdriver and by magnetizing it, it just helps me to be able to draw out these screws. And again, we're looking for the screws closest to the leading wheel set on each bogey. And one final screw just down here. Once we've got all those screws out, I'm just going to remove the foam carefully turn this locomotive right side up. You will need to carefully unplug some of the multiple working cables just at either end of the model and just lift it around the buffer just to be on the safe side. And just carefully lift this up. I'm just going to go to one side. You can see the wire that goes up there. There's not a lot of slack on this. And we're just going to very, very carefully pull that plug out. It's just a simple plug fit. Up there in the roof, we can see we've got the small can motor that drives the fan through a worm. And it's a really interesting mechanism and quite effective as well. These are the brass flywheels. Each of the motor bogies has its own motor and that huge heavy lump of brass ensures super smooth running at all times. This is the XL decoder socket. I must admit this is a type that I'm not familiar with but it does appear to be fairly simple to rock that clear. This is the blanking plate but as you can see the actual decoder itself would have the appropriate pins to match up and to give you full functionality and control. Just down here, inside the model, it is handy to note that we do have a whole load of tiny little solder tabs, and these are helpfully marked up. And it would appear that it's also possible to wire in another type of decoder, should you so wish. Something like the Zen Buddha from DCC Concepts, or the AE model's large decoder, which are designed for models of this type. With the body off, we can also see all of that detail finished 
and complete inside the cabs. We've got cab lighting hidden away up in these tanks and we've got all of the detail coloured and picked out on the bulkhead front. There's also a full control desk with all of the detail including handles and with the drivers and second man's chairs these are full height and perfect for addition of O gauge figures. Again looking to the other end we've got all that detail picked out and even the doors through the bulkhead are prototypically accurate. Central on this end to one side on the other. The locomotive also natively supports a speaker installation and that will allow the matching mega bass speaker with any sound decoder that you add in. Refitting the body is just a simple reversal of that process. First of all we just need to make sure that we have the chassis and the body the correct way round. Make sure you reconnect the fan plug with the fan plug replaced and we just line up the body, slide that back down, roll it over and then refit the four screws. And then it's just a simple task of reapplying the multiple working cables at both ends. As you would expect with twin motor twin flywheel this is a little bit of a power hungry locomotive and it's advisable to have a power supply system on DC that is designed specifically for O gauge and above locomotives. On DCC the ESU XL decoder gives more than enough grunt to power this and certainly with twin motor twin flywheel all wheel drive all wheel pickup and the weight that is on offer with this there was no problems whatsoever getting it to run on my small shunting layout. Power pickup was slow and precise and it really did feel like this locomotive had so much in reserve. There was plenty of momentum too helped by the weight and those two massive brass flywheels and really it was a pleasure to do shunting with this locomotive. Never before have I found a locomotive that has made what to me is one of the most mundane of activities in railway modelling actually very enjoyable indeed. For fitting the detail I've chosen not to fit any of the discs as this is going to be a post 1980 locomotive. But the small three piece snow ploughs were very much a fixture of this class in Scotland and these are relatively easy to fit though you will need to fiddle them in around the pipework and they slot into two holes in the buffer beam base. So we turn now to the scores. First up is build quality and actually everything about this model really does feel like it's been incredibly well designed. From the choice of materials to the amount of weight that's in it, the etched grills and everything else besides it really does feel that this is a quality model oozing from every orifice. If I had to fault anything it might be that on the wheels some of the weathering hasn't quite fully covered the wheel faces and this is probably because these were not rotated whilst the weathering was being applied but actually it's not a huge issue. The only other area is that some of the multiple working pipes are very prone to breaking where they have to be removed in order to get into the model but it really is splitting hairs and overall I'm going to give this a 9.8. On running quality the model performs exceptionally well. Twin motor, twin flywheel and there's a lot of flywheel it's a huge lump of brass mean that this locomotive is not short of power and is not short of torque. It glides gracefully and there's a real feeling of both momentum and a lot of power in reserve. In this area there's nothing to fault and I give it the full 10 out of 10. On DCC fitting and innovation I really like the rooftop fan driven by a separate small motor and if you've got a DCC decoder that can deal with this such as the ESU XL then it really is a nice feature. 
whereby the fan can be spun up and spun down in accordance with the heat cycle and in conjunction with any sound files, completely independently of the locomotive actually moving. It's a great feature. And coupled with this, we've got a full suite of lighting options, making the absolute most of all that DCC can offer. If I had to pick fault, it's probably that the ESUXL decoder interface is a little bit specialist. I couldn't find any non-sound versions, and you might be saying, well, with a locomotive this special, why wouldn't you want to fit sound? But it does add a lot of extra cost, and for those modelers who maybe want to do it in stages, it's a very difficult route, it seems, to just fit this with basic DCC. So even though that innovation is there, I'm going to give this a 9.0. Accuracy and quality of finish. Again, the model really does ooze perfection from every single pore. There's nothing that I could fault with it. And looking closely at photographs, I struggled to be able to find anything that I could point at and go, you got that wrong, because quite frankly, they didn't. So I'm going to give this a 10 out of 10. Next up, we turn to value for money. And we've got a link in the description box to take you to where you can find all the different versions of the Hellion O-Gage Class 26. It costs £550 approximately for the unweathered versions and approximately £568 for the weathered versions such as the one that you've seen in this review. Now you might think that that's just a little bit expensive and I'm going to stop you on that train of thought right now because quite apart from the fact that this is O-Gage you do get a huge amount of locomotive for your money. The detail is incredible. There is far, far more detail than you could ever expect in even the most sublime of 00 models. And when you think that the 00 models are already pushing around £300 for the spec that we've got inside this, then actually you're not paying much more than that for something that really is quite special. From its three motor design, two on the transmission with massive brass flywheels and a further third to control independently that rooftop fan underneath the grill, there really is a lot going on. So I'm going to give this a 9.1 and that gives us a final score of an incredibly respectable 47.9. The model has been loaned by Hellion but actually it's won me over. And even before I finished filming this video, I contacted Hellion and said, can I buy it? I actually really do like it. So I've bought this model and very firmly put my money where my mouth is. So this will become a permanent part of my collection. And you know what? There's no regrets on that. This really is a superb model at a really good price. I hope you really enjoyed today's video and we've got a link in the description box down below. It takes you to Rails of Sheffield to help you find one of the Class 26s from Hellion in O-Gage if it really tickles your fancy. And they've got them in a number of different liveries from their original as delivered green right through to some of the sectorization liveries uh, to suit a model right through to the very twilight of their existence on British Rail in the early 1990s. Please tickle that like button, share this video, subscribe to the channel too to be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. You can also head on over to Patreon and from as little as $1 a month there are a great many different tiers of rewards to help the channel to keep making the videos that you want to see. And uh, we've got a link down below as well to our exclusive Monday Club Wagon Commission, which is uh, expected in the new year, 2023. So get your orders in quick. It is selling really, really well and is sure to sell out in no time at all. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirk, saying you take great care of yourself. Happy modelling, bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, 
Makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. Additional support comes from Rails of Sheffield. Sell to the name you know and trust. Family-run business purchasing collections for over 50 years. From single items to lifetime collections, no collection is too small or too big. Buy, sell or exchange, any age or any gauge. Rails will take everything locos, coaches, wagons, track work, controllers, accessories. In fact, they will take absolutely everything and certainly will not cherry pick the best items. Rails are only a phone call away. Call them now for the very best price and get instant cash payment or same day transfer. Check them out today at the link below. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Offshore Allen, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Sparky107107, George Botterini, Chris Moss, Robert Steers, Sam Yates, Dale Williams, John N. from NC, NYM Arish, Jonathan Foster, Peter, Clifford Ison, Larry W. Grant, NI Railways 4000 Class, Ian Coulson, Alan Dickerson, Eddie Papair, Karen Nicholl, Medwin Williams, Crossways Point Junction, 3B Rail, Jennifer Horton, and James Beckett. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.